it's great to have a chance to talk with you again and stuff. And first of all, I just want to be, uh, I want to congratulate you on the publication of your new book. This is awesome. I've actually for had a chance to read it. And uh, it's so great to see a book like this out in the public. So congratulations. And it's great to see you again. It's great to see you, Alan. And thank you for the kind words. I mean, I want to, uh, all props go also to my co-author, Natalie. She, uh, amazing, amazing amount of uh, ideation and curation together. It was a real privilege to work with her as well. So thank you for the nice words. Oh, no, no, no. It's a, it's my pleasure. I've known Natalie and now you for a long time. And so it's, it's great to see you guys working together. But let's get into this. You know, for those of you who aren't totally familiar with this, the title of the book is Empathy in Action. And empathy is one of those fascinating terms in the tech space. So let me ask you this, Tony. Um, why empathy? Why now? Why should this be an imperative for, you know, businesses out there that are dealing with all this change? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. And, I, I, you know, it's interesting for me. Uh, I started to think about empathy really when I joined Genesis. And it came from a place really around uh, sort of if you think about business and, and the way business has been shaped, it's really been shaped by a lot of sort of financial metrics, um, business centric kind of things, you know, whether it's top line, bottom line, but there was no kind of mention of the people that ran the companies. And often there was no mention in those metrics of, of what really matters to a business, which is what, you know, how good the experience is that you offer you as a business to your downstream customers, whatever that business may be. And so I think that was kind of what uh, piqued my interest. And it really came from what we do at Genesis, right, which is deliver customer experience software. And as I was sort of talking to customers, talking to partners, talking to agents, talking to employees, and never really heard anything that was really about how it made the person feel. And so I think what kind of hit me was that a lot of the old business approaches, um, which were mainly around efficiency and effectiveness, hadn't really made this mental shift to really like, if I could get the agents and the people that serve the end customers feeling happy and good about what they do, feeling heard and listened to on the employee side. And on the same time, on the customer side, ultimately you should have a better, better experience. And then I think on top of that, Alan, what happened, of course, is we saw uh, the pandemic. Um, and once we sort of got beyond business kind of continuity, getting people up and running, it became incredibly obvious to, I think, everyone, the most important thing that a business could do was make sure that uh, – its employees felt heard, understood, and safe and in a trusted environment and exactly the same thing with the customers they serve. In fact, what um, we really saw was the need for empathy sort of went up massively. You know, you'd have customers calling in to a business, not just because of a customer support issue, but almost as a lifeline, someone to talk to because they were isolated and so on. And so I really think that uh, we had had this view of it. We thought it was time to change from a business-centric to people-centric world. But on top of that, the pandemic, I think, opened the eyes to many, many businesses and many, many consumers that it's really important to have this authentic, rich uh, conversation between the, the business and the customer. Well, that's awesome. But, I mean, you come from a long history in the technology space. I mean, you know, you and I have both been in tech for well over 20 years. And we've heard these terms, customer service, customer experience. I mean, you just used it. And they've been around forever, but they've never really actually meant a lot. So when you look at this empathy in action, as we bring empathy, and I'll just be honest, I think empathy is a great word. It's a really misunderstand, understood word in our space. But when you bring in customer service, where does that start? And how do you see that evolution happening from customer service into customer experience? And where's it going from there? It is a lovely word, um, but maybe we should unpack it a little bit first and then we'll kind of talk about the evolution. I think one of the things that often happens with a word like empathy is it can get a little bit misunderstood and sort of a fuzzy kumbaya kind of, um, you know, make you feel good um, kind of word. But what it means to us, and we articulate this very deeply in the book, it's really a framework, right? It's about um, sort of never really judging someone's situation. Right. Uh, something my mother sort of instilled to me, and we talk about it in the book at a very young age, which is never judge someone and you walk, until you walk a mile in their shoes. And in a way, if you think about customer support, just to kind of give you that sort of analogy, often there was a preset script or there was a preset way of doing something. Right? If you think about the evolution of the contact center, I mean, essentially it was sort of like a switchboard 
where, you know, you'd sort of connect someone based on a very quick chat that you had with the customer and you hope you routed them right. And then over time, call centers evolved and we use things like IVR with sort of set plans that hopefully fit into a, a certain way of doing things. But it didn't really have this aspect of actually listening to the context of where the customer was coming from. I mean, at the root of empathy, uh, we describe this empathy in action um, framework, and it's really about listening, right? It's about listening to the signals, to the data, just like it is in the workforce um, when you have a relationship between a manager and an employee. First, you've got to listen. Then you've got to try and understand. And only then, in the context, right, of that particular situation, can you start to predict or route you to the right place. Then, of course, once you do that, and hopefully you get a good outcome, you need to put that cycle back, that cycle of learning. So the next time they come in with a, a, a customer support question, they can actually, you can know and you can have understanding of, well, this is what happened last time. So why would I ask them all the same questions? Or this is a, a type of way they wanted to interact with me. So let's do that this time. And that's really key. I think that's really the delta difference between sort of base customer support and turning this into an experience one that's empathetic, so you listen, you understand, you take the time, um, and then hopefully, if you do it right, and we believe that technology now exists to do to, to do that, um, you can deliver a delightful experience that keeps them coming back, keeps them as raving fans, keeps them wanting to be uh, um, loyal and trusted to you, and obviously buy more product from you. It's fascinating because you know traditionally Genesis has been a contact center, contact service type of company. And, you know, for so long, we've sit here and we've thought about the fact that, quote unquote, customer experience sits in marketing. But when we look at all the data flow that's coming through from customers into the contact center and customer support, all of a sudden that nexus of where customer experience is, is actually shifting more towards the contact center. But there's something else I'd like you to unpack for me for just a second, Tony. And that is, is that I mean, this is really what you've talked about so far is kind of specific towards the contact center, but bring it up a level for an executive who doesn't work in this space. Somebody who says, you know, I'm in a different area of technology. Maybe I'm a hardware provider or maybe I work in retail or hospitality. Bring it up a level and tell me, tell me what that looks like. Well, it's interesting you bring it up because it's a little bit in my blood. Uh, uh, for those who don't know me well, I, I grew up uh, um in a very strong hardware provider, Cisco. Um, I also ran uh, a very large scale consumer uh, software company, Skype, one of the largest mobile app companies in the world, as well as, uh, um, as, as you know, Alan, I did a stint as president of GoPro where the consumer product was really about sort of uh, that, you know, that, that feeling almost a movement in how you, you interacted with the product. So I really speak from a sort of a personal level on this, which is that, to me, what I've noticed in each one of those transitions, it doesn't matter how good your individual product is or how good your marketing brand is, if you can't deliver that brand promise, those values that you may set out in your marketing message through the full experience, no matter what door of the business you come in, to use your example, you know, maybe it's a retail business, right? They train the, the, the ambassadors who sit in those stores and serve the customers to have these values, right? But if that doesn't translate uh, when you call the 1-800 number or that doesn't translate when you get um, a marketing message, then you have this very disjoint experience. And so what we've seen, and, and you touched on it, is like any time there's a real-time moment of engagement, it's a moment of truth to either serve the customer uh, with a delightful, empathetic experience and have them come back or it isn't, right? And what I would say is what we hear increasingly, it's the most strategic touch point. Wherever you come through the genius bar, the retail store, uh, you know, the, the business chat uh, channel, the, the 1-800 number, um, the returns group, you want to have an end-to-end -end experience. And what I would put it to you is why do we see this big transformation to the contact center is it is the most mission critical part of many businesses. It is the true front door where you have those real time or near real time moments, right? When you're actually speaking to someone in the company, just like the retail example that you used. And what I would say is 
Now we're at a point where we can collect all of that data, all of those signals, especially when we get customers to the cloud. And now we can start to really understand the history and the context. And I think that's really an important thing, which is people want to feel like they have a personalized experience. That doesn't mean to say that every single experience is individual for a a billion um, customers, if that happens to be your business. But you want to feel like they understand the history and context and serve you universally across any of those uh, ways into the company. Now, now I know you've you and I have talked about this numerous times, so I'm going to push back a little bit. Is personalization really what customers want? I mean, because I know I've gotten the mail that's misspelled. I've gotten emails that were, you know, inappropriate, you know, not really personalized towards me. Or is it more about contextualization? Because you use both of those terms. So what's it really, really about? I think what it's really about is, is, is this notion of context. And, and you helped me through this, by the way, which is I think people misunderstand a little bit personalization. Uh, firstly, I think up till now, the state of the art when people talk about personalization has been anything but personal, right, to your point. It's actually sort of put, it's persona-based or cohort-based. It would say, you know, a certain group of a certain demographic of a certain age should be served this way. The challenge with that is that that may be true for certain things, but when you really want to have that rich, empathetic experience, that thing that makes you want to come back and feel like <clears throat> they really know you, it needs this idea of context. And it actually needs, I think, two things, context and time. That's why I talk a lot about history. Because if you don't have that knowledge of what happened last time, how can you possibly sort of uh, decide what's personal for that moment? To the point you made to me the other day, which I think is very powerful, is we're changing all the time, right? So to think that you can somehow make a uniquely personalized approach for every single person on the planet, it's just, it's just not tenable. But I think this idea of, history and context approaches the idea of what people uh, want, which is they want to feel listened and heard. They want to feel like it's a personal engagement. The challenge up to now is the state of the art of many businesses has been using the word personalization, but they're really using it more in a targeting context around a cohort. So I think that's the delta difference. Um, I think this happens a lot with, you know, different jargon that people tend to use. Um, I like to think about it more as an empathetic experience, not a journey that sometimes get used that for you, it felt like they understood where you were coming from. That's that's the context. They understood kind of what had happened the last few, three or four times you interacted. That's the history that kind of transcends time and then delivers that in the best possible way, given the tools that you have available on the data. And that's what makes it feel more personalized. I think you're hitting it. As we say, you know, you're hitting the nail right on the head. But what that is also forcing is that's also forcing a shift in customer centricity. What does customer centricity really look like? Because, you know, when I used to walk into the general store, or I'll I'll give the example, when I was a kid, we'd go into the donut shop in the little town I grew up in and talk to all the farmers. They knew what I was going to order ahead of time. They saw me pulling into the parking lot. They, you know, had my coffee and donut ready for me. But customer centricity through this lens of technology like we're doing today, through this brand new rubric that we're building, how has that changed and what does that look like going forward? So look, technology has really helped us scale. And I think technology up till now has really sort of been focused on those first two E's that I talked about before, right? Efficiency and effectiveness. So it's, you know, it's allowed us to automate certain processes It's allowed um, the ability to um, do things much quicker, which, by the way, is very important in in a customer-centric world. Customers um, have a limited amount of time. They want things to happen efficiently and effective. But I think if you take this word customer centricity to the next level, it's got to actually show up in the way you just described in your local donut shop. They've got to know more about you. You They've got to know kind of your expectations And I think it's got to show up in the technology that gets delivered in the way that people start to uh, actually design products, actually design the experiences. Now, there's a lot of focus today, I think, in the modern world around design thinking. At the root of design thinking is really understanding the personal connections and really tailoring them. I think really what I'm getting at is that customer um, centricity as we move forward needs to really adapt and evolve to e-thinking, to empathetic thinking. If you think about every time 
that you interacted with a customer. And by the way, I think this whole discussion we're having today isn't just about a customer experience. And we talk about this in the book. The same thing exists in the employee experience in your own enterprise or your own company. If every interaction you took into account a sense of knowing what where the other person was coming from, remember it's people, it's not business metrics, where they were coming from, you would start to design things very, very differently. At the highest level, I think customer centricity moving forward needs to factor in that it's really about people, their expectations, and designing things around that kind of equation and less around you know, OKRs or KPIs that really are about moving the business needle. You need to do those things as well. Don't get me wrong. But I think long term, you see, especially in the experience economy that we live in today, um, with all these disruptors coming with all kinds of new products and services that if you aren't thinking about the person who's consuming those services, either um, from a business to a consumer, from a business to a business, uh, or from a, a business to an enterprise, so you know, B2B, B2C, and B2E, you will not have a long-term sustainable business, in my opinion. But there's a piece there that you talked about that I want to go back to, because you talked about employees and employee experience. You know, I've, for the longest time, I've had a hard time with the term human resources, HR. It's like we're just another input into the factory. And I, and I hate that because humans are so much more. So with these, with this new lens of technology, all the changes that we're going through, how does this change what the employee experience looks like? And how, how do you connect that back to the customer experience? Well, I think especially in the space that we play, which is really in orchestrating experiences with the front-facing real-time, the synchronous um, kind of um, interactions that a customer has, I think uh, it starts right there. And the way I would describe it, back to the the business centricity of the past, moving to more people or customer-centric, you've got to sort of change your mindset. You mentioned it, and I, and I agree. It, it's sort of it's really difficult when people talk about human capital or human resources. Um, you know, it's kind of making them seem like they're just another financial asset. It turns out it's obvious if you have and you engage your employees, and they feel incredibly connected, they feel like they have a voice at the table, they feel an empathetic leadership team. They generally uh, not only stay at the company longer, they tend to perform better. Right? I'm, I'm not really saying anything that you probably you can refute. Um, but it turns out that it's even more than that, right? They are the representatives of the brand. They're actually the asset, the differentiated asset, but not on a, you know, how efficient they can be, on how they express the experience towards the, the customer. And I think that, remember, agents, right? We know that uh, they have a very, very difficult job. We know that it's very challenging sometimes to deal with certain things. But if you treat them in the way that I'm describing and that we want to treat customers, they will become the number one differentiated part of a business. And I think that that is something that is an aha, mo- aha moment that we saw through the pandemic. You know, we did a study um, and just um, talked to a number of end consumers and, you know, how did they interact um, uh, with the customer support center or the contact center? And what we found is that many, many of them weren't just calling in, you know, let's take a bank example because they were worried about their overdraft or their small business loan. They were calling in for a lifeline. They were calling in for someone who could actually help them navigate through some of the stress and turmoil that went beyond just worrying about a financial issue. And so if you think about turning that on its head and saying, okay, I get it, Tony, if I've got uh, a more empathetic environment, I've got happier employees Uh, I've got employees that really are proponents of the brand, that becomes a symbiotic relationship between the customer and the employee as well. And I think just to, you know, um, complete that picture, we know there's the great resignation happening. We know that people are are struggling with sort of what they want to do in terms of their um, kind of life choices. But what we also know is if you have empathetic leadership who understands where they're coming from and treats them fairly and respectful in the process, you, you generally see those companies thriving right now. I think we're in 100% agreement there. But the one thing I want to come back to then is, is that, you know, we live in a more complex technology world every single day. And 
you know, going back to your terms, efficiency and effectiveness, you know, if we go back to the old Weberian model of bureaucracy and stuff, how we insert that technology in there to make us more efficient, more effective, you know, isn't there a danger of some sort that technology is going to become too much of a barrier between the customer and the employee? Well, I think that is always there, um, but I think I'll take it back. I think that this is – the book is really about stimulating a strategic dialogue to rethink not just customer experience or employee experience, rethink the way that you think about the values of your company. And we give lots of examples around blind spots uh, that happen in every company. And by the way, this is something I think about as a CEO all the time. We've got to make sure that um, as technology evolves – whilst it creates tons of opportunity, you never lose sight of this customer and employee centricity in what you do. So you can't just jump to the new technology because it's hot or it's buzzworthy. It needs to solve a problem relative to what we talk about. Um, and I, I want to put it to folks out there, they've got to reframe also some of the metrics they care about. It's very important uh, to care about efficiency and effectiveness. Like, don't get me wrong, and there's great technologies to do that. But if you lose the plot at the end of the day, you automate everything, but you have a great brand and value message and even a great product, but you don't deliver this incredibly empathetic experience, I think that you're going to struggle over the long haul with, with your approach. And so really what we talk about there is sparking an idea that's a wake-up call. You can have all the great technology in the world, but if you don't put the, the, um, your employees and your customers at the heart of everything you do, and I'll put it that we're going to move from D schools to E schools because my hypothesis is that it's efficiency and effectiveness times the force multiplier of empathy used in the right way, as you mentioned, Alan, so we don't create too much confusion with too many technology choices. Uh, these will, and if you think about it already, folks that focus this way, they may not have articulated like this. These are the greatest companies who do deliver the best experiences and are thriving the most. So I'm going to go ahead and bring it full circle, if that's okay, Tony. So does this mean if I were to look forward three, five, ten years, that empathy and the need for us to actually become more empathetic, to become more human again, is that going to drive a business model change? I'm not talking about getting rid of capitalism or, you know, C-Corp, but is it is it really going to change what our businesses potentially look like and how success is defined? Well, look, firstly, I hope so, because fundamentally, um, you know, I think we need more empathy in society across everything that we do. You know, things tend to get polarized very quickly and we tend to forget just that moment of the empathy in action framework of really understanding where someone's coming from. So at the highest level, you know, that's a, a hope that goes even beyond how a company runs. But I do think it's the imperative um, and will become the number one business differentiator because... Uh, as we know, you know, the newer generation, they're very, very savvy when it comes to uh, technology. And there's been so much talk about digital transformation, but it's not just about using technology. Uh, it's about really how you think about that end to end experience. And so if you want to really be a thriving business, I think you are going to have to shift that. Now, how that shows up in the business model uh, is a great question. Um, the first place uh, I hope and what we really um put out there provocatively in the businesses, you've got to have the business leaders in the company wake up, understand that it's something bigger than just business metrics, start measuring those. And we give a whole bunch of examples, including an assessment you can take of kind of where you are on the empathy meter. Uh, we started working on this idea of an empathy index or an, an experience index that really adds empathy to the equation, um, unlike some of the, the standards you see today, like MPS. So really evolving the thinking. So I think that's the first step. And then I think you will start to see some innovative business models. You know, some of the models that exist today, particularly in large scale consumer, um, maybe they aren't as empathetic as they could be. They take a lot of your data, right? And then they try and serve you an ad, but just as you talked about, often not contextual, not in the way that people really want to receive it. And so I don't know how it evolved, but I hope that uh, the work that we've we've put out there stimulates new business models that are much more people centric and less business centric. But again, to your point, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean to say that you can't have uh, businesses that don't make money that don't thrive. Um, but I think you can reframe some of these business models as we move forward. You know, this is this has been an amazing conversation, and I really, really hope that this is 
the first stepping stone for so many business leaders to transform how it is they look at the world and how they move forward with empathy. Um, because I really, I do think that is a cornerstone for businesses in the future. But Tony, I really, I really want to thank you for the conversation today. This has been absolutely fabulous. It's always great to talk to you. And again, congratulations to you and Natalie on getting this book out. Um, you know, I am recommending it to quite a few people, so I hope it keeps picking up. And congratulations on your bestseller status on a couple of the really high level lists. So I'm excited for you, but thank you so much for your time today. And thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Alan. Thanks for your thought leadership. Um, it's been great to uh, compare notes, spar, learn from each other. Um, this is really important to me as well. You know, look, we don't have all the answers. We're, we're really trying to stimulate a new way of thinking and, you know, take the time if you can to, to read the book or read snippets for the book. And we'll continue on this journey together, I hope. Sounds great, Tony. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Thanks.